Thank you so much for being here, uh, joining us tonight to watch uh, Blue Streets. Hope that you found it thought-provoking and that you learned something about community organizing as you're watching. Maybe a little bit about social justice and the all too real phenomenon that is the dehumanization of black lives. So my name is Antoinette Gomes. For those of you who don't, don't know me, I'm the director of the Unity Center here at Rhode Island College, which is a department in the Community Equity and Diversity Division. And our mission is to promote the accessibility of educational services and the opportunity for excellent scholarship uh, to all of our students here at the college through collaborative programming with uh, our student affiliates, faculty, staff, and the wider community. And we seek to do that um, by enhancing awareness, providing safe and welcoming forums like this one uh, for exploring issues that pertain to diversity and equity. Um, we try to engage students in meaningful dialogue about their experiences, their social experience, their personal experiences, their academic experiences here at Rhode College. We also challenge stereotypes of racism, of sexism, homophobia, classism, and other forms of oppression. And by providing supportive services and opportunities and referrals. So the Unity Center is comprised of the Women's Center, the LGBTQ Plus Office, the International Student Office, and Interfaith Services. And if I do say so myself, it's a pretty amazing student lounge. <laughs> We're located, <laughs> located on the uh, lower level of the Dunham Dining Center. And you're all invited to come by. So now it's my pleasure um, to, uh, to inform you of our speakers uh, this evening. And um, I'm going to start with our moderator. And uh, if, when I say your name, if you could just come up and, and, and take your place up here. Um, but a couple of points of housekeeping first. There's going to be some videotaping going on. It's going to be going on during the panel's presentation, but during the audience interaction, it will stop. We'll ask that we all, as Brittany said, over and over in this documentary, love and support each other this evening. Um, please be respectful in your commentary. Please be mindful of the, font, of the fact that uh, there are time constraints. So we're just asking you not to have the mic. Everybody can have, who wants to speak can have a chance to do so. And then lastly, this documentary will be available through the Lending Library at the Unity Center for those of you who either want to watch it again or want to share it with others. So, it's my pleasure now to introduce the moderator for tonight's panel discussion. His name is Marco McWilliams. scholar, community organizer. He's the founding instructor of the Black Studies Freedom School, community-based political education freedom school in Providence. Um, he's also an adjunct professor teaching African American studies and community organizing for middle school through college. He's my friend. Uh, and then the panelists. Sadna Berry, Dr. Sadna Berry, is director of Africana Studies here at Rhode Island College. And uh, her research and teaching interests are centered on critical race theory, black radical thought, black feminism, ontology, the making of memories and amnesias of slavery in slavery's afterlife, and critical studies of white supremacy and whiteness. Yeah. Yeah, let's give it up for Sadna. No? Bollinger. Dr. Bollinger is Associate Professor and Director of Film Studies here at Rhode Island College. He has published studies on American, Soviet, and Polish documentary films. He regularly teaches a course on documentary history and is currently co-teaching a course on documentary film production. Vince Bollinger. <laughs> Charina Herrera is a McNair... <laughs> is a McNair Scholar, 
here at Rhode Island College majoring in Africana Studies. Her passion is critiquing Western society through pro-black lenses and using that knowledge to foster change in her community. Her story begins in the south side of Providence, where she still resides. Sharina Herrera. And last, but most certainly not least, Daryl Walker Jr. is a central committee member of Rhode Island Socialists. He has a Master of Arts degree in Sociology and Anthropology from Northeastern University and is an alumnus of Rhode Island College. Okay, have a vibrant discussion, enjoy. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. As I always say when I open up, I'm looking to have some robust and uninhibited dialogue. Uh, in fact, we can't have a conversation on freedom if we're not talking free. So we're going to talk free tonight. Um, I'm here to moderate. And so I just want to do we want to. Uh, open up a space and uh, for the panelists to speak, to join our voice with theirs, to ask critical questions, uh, get us some knowledge, and hopefully step away with something that moves us a little closer uh, to something called freedom and you know, critical conversation. Um, maybe we can move down the panel and uh, have the panelists just open up with an open statement and, but it's a reflection on the film, the different points of contact. Sometimes we can feel, you know, when you're engaged in that moment, and after the film, you feel like it's time, you have a little bit of time and a little bit of headspace to kind of process this stuff a little bit more. It's crazy when it's going down. Um, but, but yeah, let's, let's, let's do that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead. Uh, my first impression of the film, can you hear me? My first uh, impression of the film was being happy that there were no police interviewed for the documentary. Um, you know, I think it's important, it's really important to remember that during slavery, uh, black folks could not testify against white folks in court. Um, so the fact that there were no cops, no um, otherwise people testifying on behalf of the cops interview for the film is uh, really important. It's important to have the people that were there on the ground, people uh, testifying on behalf of the black people um, was really, really essential. Because usually we're testifying on behalf of, we have the, the mainstream corporate media um, demonizing us, calling us villains, uh, hoodlums, looting, so on and so forth. So to have the documentary kind of humanize us, we see the film go into the, the, the private spaces of the, the protesters um, to see what they do in their, their personal lives. Uh, did a lot of uh, great work there. Okay. Hi. Um, yeah, so it's, I just want to thank the organizers for this, um, for showing this fantastic film. It's really, um, both an honor and, and very exciting to uh, be in a room talking about a film that I think is really great, not just in terms of the content and the power of the content, but I have to say it's also really fantastic in terms of its form. It's just, I think, a really well put together documentary. Um, I'll speak really briefly. Uh, one thing that I think is quite interesting about it is just how it kind of picks up a particular kind of legacy of what documentary strives to do, and I think it's doing it rather self-consciously. The film starts with a discussion in the car about education, right? And what I think the film strives to do is actually educate, which I think is something that documentaries, before they were even called documentaries, um, saw their saw their role as um, as educating. And and the way that it does it here, that I think is really effective, is through um, a plurality of voices. So what we get are multiple. It's not just following one person. It's we're following, we don't even have one main protagonist really, one of the protagonists. We have multiple 
right, with multiple experiences. And so it's really about the ways in which we think of each life as a different circle, right? The ways in which all these circles overlap. And I think what's really powerful about that is um, documentaries are about, in a fundamental way, about reality and about truth. And I think it, it stays a really strong claim about what really happened and what has happened and all that and, 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 and pushes for truth by, by virtue of kind of drawing upon the plurality of voices, right? So this is the experience of multiple people, right? Lots and lots and lots of people. And it's not just the people that we're following, but we see social media feed that, you know, um, when we see all of these and, ex and see what they're experiencing, then that's how the film kind of works against the mainstream approach to how these documents, how this, these events were talked about and what is the official record of what happened versus what people actually experienced. So I'll just leave it at that. I'm very curious to hear what people's questions and comments are. Thank you. Um, you can hear me, I'm sure. Anyway, I'm used to speaking very loudly because I talk in a classroom all the time, so I don't really need a mic. Um, I have two thoughts. I watched this film last night in preparation for today, and then I have a quotation from somebody who's actually quoted in the documentary that I want to just put out there for us to think about. So my first thought as this documentary started, I think what really hit me is because I think it's a very profound thing is a question of love. That resistance, especially resistance against anti-blackness and the dehumanization of blackness is an act of love. So no matter what form the resistance takes, it is always an act of love. And in fact, uh, to love blackness, to love one another, um, is also a form of protest. So in a society where uh, blackness is not given any value whatsoever. To love blackness is always an act of resistance, just like resistance is always an act of love, loving blackness. That's the first thing, and I think it's so interesting because lots of people keep referring to it through the film. We love one another, we do this for love. So that's the first thing that it to be when I watch this. The second thing, which is more uh, something that I don't have answers to, obviously, but that uh, made me think was very often, even unfortunately in this documentary at times, there's a sense that somehow democracy has gone wrong. Mm -hmm. That what we are watching in this film is the excesses against democracy. Mm -hmm. And I would just like to put forward the idea that America has never ever been a democracy. Mm -hmm. when it was found, it wasn't democracy with the Declaration of Independence, it wasn't a democracy during slavery, during colonization and genocide, it's never been democracy ever. So these acts that we are seeing and the protests that we are seeing are not about fixing democracy because there is no such thing as democracy in America. So that's something I hope that we can talk about because this is the American democracy project. <laughs> uh, so what, 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 what do we mean by the American democracy project? Is it just another myth? Is it just something we're trying to fool ourselves? Mm. And last of all, as I was finished watching this film, I went to my study and on my wall, I have a few sayings from a few people and there's a quote from Fanon that I am very inspired by and mindful of always. And it has to do with something that was said in the documentary. What form of resistance should this be? And I looked at Fanon's the quote from Fanon, he's also quoted in this film, and I wrote it down. It's just something I'd like to think about myself and maybe think with you if you are want to think about it. And this is what Fanon said. He said, having a gun is sometimes the only chance you still have of giving meaning to your death. Mm. Wow. He's talking during the anti-colonial war in Algeria against the French. And he says, having a gun is sometimes the only chance you still have of giving meaning, not to your life, but to your death. Mm. 
particularly important that they use Malcolm, or not, not Malcolm, Martin's quote in the movie because we have this idea of Martin Luther King Jr. of him being this nonviolent person and um, peace over everything, juxtaposed to the violence that was shown in the film, um, which he later on in his life was like pro. Um, so I think it was important for them to use that quote in particular because it was against what we believe Martin Luther King Jr. was. Um, but yeah, that's what I have to say. Um, just by uh, a show of hands, is anyone familiar with the, the Community Safety Act in Providence? Okay. Um, I think that some of the, the local organizations around here did some tremendous work to get some reforms passed, but it's far from perfect and the police can still kill us. So I think that we should not rely upon the, um, the police to police themselves. We have to uh, effectively do that for us. We need community self-defense. That's where I think the next step is. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'll take a stab at it. So uh, I'm not thinking necessarily of immediate or practical steps. So sometimes when I think about, maybe I'm going to say something which is not very popular. But I'm going to say that different people have different struggles, actually, in order to contribute. So I think the goal is always to dismantle white supremacy. Right? That's the foundation. How do we go about doing it? I think um, different groups have different responsibilities. So when we talk about racism, and I say this with many years of experience about teaching about this, and students always ask me in class, so, OK, you keep talking about racism and white supremacy, so what can we do? And very often, the people who ask me are younger white students. And for them, I always reply with what Malcolm X told a young woman, white woman, who asked him the same question. She asked him, well, what can I do to help, right? And he said, well, the problem is that you can't really help us because racism is a white problem. White supremacy is a system that's instituted for the benefit of white people. So if you're white, that's where you need to fight. Right? You need to fight in your own community. You need to, whether it's education, whether it's resistance, whether it's uh, uh, writing editorials, I don't know whatever form it would take for people. But I think for white people, the struggle is there. Right? That's where you have to struggle, where white people have to struggle. Where Asians, I'm a South Asian, where I have to struggle is a different area, right? I can't, um, we can all be allies with each other, but I guess for an Asian person, the biggest uh, struggle would be not to keep trying to emulate whiteness mm -hmm. and instead fight, uh, fight racism in terms of the fact that the core of it is anti-blackness, right? Mm -hmm. And I, so I think, yes, we, can all, we should all be allies, but we also have to know that our struggles uh, need to also take place in different ways, in different spheres. Mm -hmm. Just a thought. Yeah, I think, um, I think the, just going, just circling back to what I said earlier about education, I think what's really valuable about the film is this notion of kind of expanding it beyond individual spheres or individual um, experiences. And I think that kind of growing awareness is what's really critical. I mean, the film, I think, very powerfully ends with the Declaration of Independence, <laughs> which and it's talking specifically about you know, the need to alter or abolish the system of government if that system of government is oppressing the people that it's supposed to be representing. Um, and so what I find remarkable is how it it's reteaching us the stuff that we're supposed to already kind of know, right? And so what we have in the film, we see how, you know, the daughter, Ricky's daughter, is shouting the slogans at the end, right? She's internalized this, and I think that's supposed to give us a sense of hope for the future, but that hope for the future only happens when everybody internalizes these experiences, right? I mean, this is a daughter who didn't just get exposed to it, but really lived through particular kinds of fears. And so I think a film like this is very useful for you know having this kind of multitude of voices 
multitude of experiences being disseminated so that everyone becomes much more intimately familiar with it, right? That's how you can kind of have that kind of experience. And from that awareness, you can kind of move forward. So, how, let's, how do we have a, uh, a, a conversation about resistance as love? Right? We, we see they use the Asada quote, um, we have to love and support each other. Uh, I enjoyed seeing that come out because I remember when folks started saying that. I was like, oh, okay, cool. So this is like an excuse for a new generation to start reading this out that haven't read this out. And, and I, I use this out in the classroom. And so, but I know that this out is not widely enough read, even in some African study programs. Um, that's changing. It's right here, Rick. Um, <laughs> okay, all right, okay. I'm getting a little worried. Um, <laughs> Yeah, how do we, you, you know, because this is traumatizing, right? Like that film was also, there was trauma all up in that, everywhere. So how do we speak to a kind of revolutionary love in which we take care of each other, um, speaking to trauma? Um, because also during this period, you know, when Black Lives Matter was in this sort of formal moment, it was a lot of folks who was running around calling themselves activists and organizers. It was like mistreating each other. How we organizing and folks talking folks behind their back, saying undermining people. And you know, like I, I was talking about a policy, like if we can't sit down and break bread together and have a meal, then I'm not organizing with you. Because that means you're not ready to like build me on a human level. So I wonder if we could speak to how do we have a kind of revolutionary love that begins with us loving ourselves and each other. Go ahead. Um, I think one of the first things we do is I think we have to teach people that revolution is not just about the leather jackets, the shop that we have raised. I think that we all have something to contribute. I think we all have gifts. And you know, whether it's whether uh, we can we speak, we write, um, maybe we uh, we sing, we dance, we all have something to, to offer the, the new world. And I think that that's part of what we can start, as uh, it said, we can start re-educating people um, as far as love and revolution. Okay. I'll go next. Um, I believe that revolution starts in you. Resistance is love. Um, in a world that is every day trying to profit from your insecurities, loving yourself is the number one rebellious act, right? So um, it starts there. Once you love yourself, it is impossible for you to hate anything else. And I think that's. Uh oh. I think. Uh, I think if you're a revolutionary in the sense that you are even an activist and you've decided to dedicate your life to changing things for more than just yourself, right? Um, I think loving yourself can't be separated from loving those you are in struggle with or those with whom you are in struggle for. I don't, I can't conceivably think of my life as separating those two. I think you love yourself, yes, but what does that really mean, absent of loving those you are struggling for and struggling with? I, I don't think that separation can exist. And I think if you're successful as a revolutionary, if you're successful as an activist, uh, you do it out of a very profound love. Right? Uh, and it's not an individualist kind of love, but it's always a very profound mm -hmm. love. And yeah, and then I, uh, I mean, yeah, I would just mm -hmm. leave it at that. would love to hear what other people think too. Mm -hmm. um, so, one thing, what I find so um, compelling and um, 
wonderfully persuasive about this notion of love is that love is something that's individual. And it's about kind of like to love someone is to actually see, you have to really understand who that person is. And when we're talking about something like police brutality or a problem with police, I mean, the, I, I think things were really well put earlier. Um, but like, it's, these are just social forces. I mean, the, the police are just a repressive state apparatus, and it's it's just doing what society, like the way in which society, it's just following how society already operates. The problem with all of this is that you know we have particular social systems, but we have individuals who occupy roles within these social systems, and so that's that's the tragedy of everything, right? I mean, it's, it's, the, it's what makes it so sticky. One thing that I found, one of the most beautiful moments in the film was when you have the black police officer, and she's there in this line with the other police officers, and what are they shouting? We're here to save her from you. You're not, you know, to, you know, and, and just, you know what you're saying when you're not with them and you're with your family and friends, you know, that kind of thing. But it, I think it, it kind of points to when she starts seeing individuals. And I think that's the key problem, right? This kid wouldn't have been killed if he was seen as an individual, right? Um, and so what I find so compelling about love is that it kind of takes it out of the sphere of the abstract, social forces, you know, oppression, and really kind of starts to anchor it in individual relationships, individual bonds. All right. Um, thank you.